Hello, everyone. My name is Priscilla Dulab. I'm a senior fellow at NORC at the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm a clinician and health services researcher, and I am delighted to be moderating this panel on using innovative technology strategies to engage black men who have sex with men with HIV in care. I'm delighted to be joined on this panel by Jeff Glotfelty, Sarah Lagrande, and Armstrong Tingwane. Slide two. A brief acknowledgments before I get started. Uh, this presentation is supported by a grant from the Health Services, Health Resources and Services Administration, Special Projects of National Significance Program. The presentation's contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official view of HRSA or the SPINS program. Next slide. So I'd like to, so next slide. Um, I'd like to start by providing a brief overview of the SPINS BMSM initiative. The formal title for this uh, program is the Implementation of Evidence-Informed Behavioral Health Models to Improve HIV Health Outcomes for Black Men Who Have Sex with Men. Next slide. So this is a three-year initiative, and the goal of the initiative is to implement, evaluate, and support replication of four evidence-informed behavioral health models in order to improve HIV health outcomes for BMSM. This means that our demonstration sites, who you will hear from during this presentation, are developing and testing models to integrate behavioral health, social support, and HIV clinical care services. Next slide. So this initiative focuses on reaching and serving exclusively black, men, black MSM with HIV. Uh, it, is uniquely, it is a uniquely vulnerable population for several reasons. The population lives with a lot of stigma around race, sexual orientation, HIV status, and mental health uh, status as well. As a consequence, this population is more vulnerable to mental health problems like depression, Black men are less likely to achieve viral suppression compared to the national um, Ryan White's HIV um, AIDS population average. They have a higher disease burden in that about half of BMSM in the US will be diagnosed with HIV in their lifetime compared to one in 11 white MSM. You know, and in light of sort of current circumstances, um, so just thinking about, you know, the spring and summer of this year, and the additional trauma related to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is hitting black communities hard, both in terms of lives lost and economic impact, the protests and the broader social uprisings that were triggered by the killing of George Floyd at the hands of officers in the Minneapolis Police Department, you know, we think this is sort of highly timely and relevant. As one of our demonstration site PIs noted that our projects are providing a soft spot for the hardest rock in America to land. And this is a mission we have taken to heart. Ultimately, reaching populations who have a hard time accessing and engaging in traditional models of care is going to be critically important for ending the HIV epidemic initiative. Next slide. So we have eight demonstration projects across the country, and you'll see these reflected in the slides uh, in front of you. Uh, so we have To Be You, With You, The Care Engagement Project, GMHC, The Village Project, Style plus love, and NORC at the University of Chicago serving in the role of the evaluation and technical assistance provider. Next slide. So the demonstration sites are implementing four different evidence-informed models of care that are being adapted to integrate behavioral health and HIV clinical care. And these include strength through youth living empowered, in short style, and this is focused on the use of social marketing and virtual support, Project SOAP, uh, recreation-based drop-in space to support artistic expression, Brothers United, the Damien Center. This is a one-stop shop model. And then the youth-focused case, youth case management, which is a peer case management support program. Next slide. So for today's presentation, we will be focusing on the technology strategies for behavioral health delivery. 
Technology offers new and innovative ways to address barriers to care and engage diverse populations. You know, in large part, they offer opportunities to meet clients where they are. They are convenient. They may obviate the need to visit a clinic. They offer privacy, so allow clients to engage with the, service that, with, with the services they need. Um, and, you know, in many cases, may prove to be lower cost to the patient. So for this session, we have three recipient sites discussing uh, innovative ways in which they have adapted technology solutions to support their clients. Specifically, our panel will be discussing the use of an integrated case management application, uh, the use of a case manager and client uh, interaction service via the use of apps, and then the use of apps to support virtual uh, support groups. So with that, it is my pleasure to hand over the presentation to Jeff Glock Salty at the Washington University School of Medicine. Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Priscilla. And hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Glaufelty. I'm from the Washington University in St. Louis uh, School of Medicine. Um, specifically, I work for Project ARC, which stands for AIDS Resource and Knowledge. The principal investigator of the With You Peer and Health Navigation Project is Katie Plax. Next slide, please. For our program, we chose to adapt the youth-focused case management model of care, um, which Priscilla mentioned just previously. Uh, this is an intensive peer-based health navigation uh, model tailored for black YMSM. Uh, we consider YMSM to be 18 to 29 years of age. We do one-on-one -on -one, uh, peer to participant sessions with activities based on three main functions. Uh, these main functions were pulled from previous program called Peers for Progress, which was looking to work with people living with diabetes. Uh, the main functions of our health navigators are to educate, support, and provide navigation to uh, clients and participants in this program. Um, all through, uh, we've interwoven goal setting around those three main functions. Next slide, please. We are utilizing two peer health navigators. Uh, Josh Alexander is on the left there and Torres Griffin is on the right. Two wonderful people that do help um, in bringing their patients and their clients in. Uh, they work as full members of the patient care team. Uh, they work with hand in hand with the medical case managers through our Ryan White um, program. Also mental wellness specialists that work on behavioral health uh, concerns or uh, promoting other mental wellness. And then the HIV providers, of course, within our infectious disease clinics. Uh, the health navigators, um, as I said, lead them through uh, goal setting, um, pr provide the education, the navigation and the support, um, but also have those resources right on hand to be able to make connections with the rest of the larger team. Next slide. Our intervention is a six month intervention. Uh, it goes for uh, two months of weekly visits and then an additional four months of monthly visits, it tapers off. Uh, from enrollment, uh, the first couple of sessions oftentimes are building rapport and starting the process of setting those goals and uh, learning how the program works. Uh, as they move the, through those first eight sessions, they work very intensively with the health navigators to address issues or barriers that they may be having um, and then kind of taper off as they work towards graduation from the program after um, their 12th session, which typically happens approximately six months out from enrollment. Next slide. Behavioral health is integrated heavily into this. Uh, one of the goals of this SPINS initiative is to also bring in the behavioral health aspect to support our young men um, who have sex with men, specifically black MSM. Uh, so we have activated mental wellness referral and follow-up as part of every session. Uh, our health navigators are prompted to uh, ask about these um, and also uh, set goals around mental wellness and behavioral health. At the beginning of the program, uh, we do an initial assessment at baseline of the mental health status and then also at six months as they graduate from those sessions, we do another mental health status um, uh, assessment. We, though you see the four tools that we use. And so if we do identify any need for mental wellness or behavioral health services, we do make a direct referral to mental wellness uh, and 
provide that referral both electronically in the EMR and then also um, kind of warm introductions. We work very closely with our mental wellness specialists. Uh, the health navigators oftentimes bring them in when possible during um, their sessions and also have weekly case conferencing that involves the mental wellness and uh, Ryan White case management teams. They also do the health navigators active follow up on referrals to peer health navigators. So it's not just putting in a referral and letting it go. They intensely follow what's going on, find out what the barriers are and help them connect. Next slide. So this pr uh, presentation is about the innovation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we innovated this program utilizing a uh, practice management app. So next slide. The peer health navigation is, um, is done primarily remotely now, obviously given the, the state of the world, but um, we had worked previous to COVID to develop a system that allowed us to do remote peer health navigation utilizing a practice management app that was HIPAA compliant and um, kind of adaptable to the needs of our clients and our program. Uh, we provide health navigation services through text uh, and phone calls, but also video chat um, that's on that practice management app. Next slide. It is internet-based and app-based, so if somebody has difficulty downloading an app or having space on their phone, they can interact with it through Wi-Fi over the internet. Uh, the practice management app uh, helps health navigators manage caseloads and communication with clients. Um, one of the biggest challenges with our peer health navigators is that there's not a specific system um, that they kind of live in every day. They document in our case management system, but this provides them something more structured so that they can kind of uh, follow their, their clients more closely and be able to do scheduling, um, direct communication uh, through the direct communication tool, which is HIPAA compliant. Uh, they can do group announcements, uh, goal monitoring. Uh, the client can set their own goals within the system and check them off as they make their way through them. They have the ability to create educational content and resources through videos or infographics. Um, and they use it as a documentation system uh, for study specific activities. It also provides scheduling opportunities through an online calendar um, that interfaces directly with the rest of the app. Next slide. Here's a quick look at a very small dashboard, <laughs> um, but it gives you an idea of what the Health Navigators dashboard looks like, and they can follow and click on any of this to do either charting um, along the top, uh, checking in on journal articles or um, different goals and metrics as they want to. They use it primarily for the appointment scheduling, which is right in the middle of your screen. Uh, there's no appointment schedule now, but they can click right there to book an appointment. The health navigator can book the appointment for the client or the client has the ability in their uh, interface to be able to book their own appointments and monitor when they're coming. Um, they use this as for the calendar, um, which provides them uh, an oversight over what they're doing that week and month uh, and who they're seeing and who they're not seeing. Next slide, please. It's also very um, compliant to cell phones. So this is a view of the With You app for a um, health navigator again. So uh, we're looking at Oh, I'm sorry, this is from the, cl the client side. So we're looking at the journal and the metrics that they can enter themselves, um, session reminders that pop up and are pushed to them through their cell phone, uh, different scheduling aspects, they can check it. You can see right in the middle that they're working on medical adherence and they're meeting their goals. Uh, and then it does also provide a, a user interface for chat if they choose to use that. So we've provided just about every possible way of communicating with, between the health navigators and clients to reduce any type of barriers of talking. Next slide. There are email notifications. These are two examples of email notifications on how they show up on the client's phone and the health navigator's phone. Um, the first is just a quick reminder via email that something's coming in. When they receive this, uh, they get it a couple days before and then day of and then right when the appointment is there, they can click on, on their session details or click right into their session using a hyperlink uh, to make life easy for them. There's also push messages sent to text if they opt into that. Uh, the health navigators also receive reminders and confirmations of 
when people sign up for appointments. Um, so when they, if a client were to sign up uh, for a session, they need to confirm that session before it's activated. Uh, and they similarly will be reminded of that session via their cell phone and they can click directly into it if they are not at a computer. Next slide, please. This is an example of the documentation that they do within the, the app. This is our end of um, session documentation that the clients do each of the for each of those weekly and monthly sessions um, and it, we've prompted we've created this to prompt them to cover certain topics um, knowing that we want them to follow up on mental wellness we can zoom in on that next slide so we'll zoom in one more time to the mental wellness check-in section. Uh, this uh, prompts the health navigators to ask if it was discussed or to mark if it was discussed if it was um, introduced or if they were had an actual referral into mental wellness services and then the follow up on those referrals and checking in if they actually did engage. Um, so this, the documentation kind of walks them through the session and they've become very good at doing this and know how to do it without the prompting, but it provides us a good space for the study to follow the progression of how people have been referred into mental wellness. Next slide. So Priscilla uh, covered some of this, but I'll talk about the benefits that we found to telehealth for our institution. Next slide. Um, definitely that reduction of barriers. Uh, one of the more difficult things that we have is um, we don't have a very reliable public transit system in St. Louis. So travel time is often difficult for our clients that are coming from the far north side. Um, so this reduces the barrier of travel in. Um, also taking time off work. A lot of our clients um, work jobs that don't give um, clear hours until the, maybe the day or week before. Um, and requesting time off can be difficult, especially for hourly workers. So this uh, provides the ability to step out during your lunchtime and do a quick session or uh, to quickly schedule something that's outside of your work hours. <clears throat> Also, um, we've had anecdotally a lot of reports of feelings of stigma in walking into our clinic. People have learned that our clinic is an infectious disease uh, clinic and that a lot of people living with HIV may go there. Um, even if it's just a perceived stigma um, on the client's part, uh, there is a, a barrier there. Um, so this allows them to do something um, and work with their health navigators much more privately rather than having to enter into another space. Uh, the app and or internet um, services that are provided for this are native to the participants world. We try very hard to not have people have to download something new with new sign-ins and everything. So they do have the option to receive just general text messages, which allows them to uh, interact more easily uh, rather than us kind of falling off of their out of sight, out of mind type of mentality. And very fortuitously, it was an easy adaptation for COVID-19, which I'll talk about in just a second. Next slide. So why the app? Um, we previous, if you can remember the days before COVID-19, um, we had a lot of uh, issues um, at our institution and in having telehealth options. Um, a lot of the options that were again, native or familiar to our clients were not HIPAA compliant. Um, the Facebook messengers, FaceTimes, Google Hangouts of the world. Um, the, some of these are coming along uh, very quickly, but um, our institution was hesitant to utilize those uh, and also protect the privacy of our clients. Um, also, uh, a lot of these uh, things require the download of an app. Um, and as I mentioned, some people don't have the space on their phone to do that or it requires a separate sign in and I forget my passwords all the time. So it, the more things you download, the more passwords you need to remember. Um, however, this app provided an all in one management space for monitoring um, progression through the program for communication, even without the download because they can do it um, through the internet if they have Wi-Fi um, or data. Client specific interface, uh, that gives us the opportunity to really look at all the aspects of the client um, and follow them. And then the exposure data for evaluation uh, fell very easily within this app. We can pull out that backend data and see kind of where our clients have been, what activities they've done. Next slide. So our early experiences with implementation, go ahead and forward slide. Um, we did have a slow transition. So a lot of people were slow to move to video. Um, people kind of love what they know and oftentimes just would prefer to interact with somebody if they were already in the clinic. So they would often uh, 
try to meet people in person. Uh, people loved having the health navigator come out to um, the clinic or on into the community to meet with them. Um, that was an easier method they felt. But however, we found that as people um, started utilizing the technology, um, they maybe got a little bit more used to it and then course COVID happened. Uh, we also uh, have seen low usage of the self-tracking functions. I think it's just another thing for people to do and they fall off pretty quickly in doing that. Um, so people aren't, haven't been entering their goals. However, our health navigators still check in on goals. Some technology glitches uh, were found early on. Um, phone models and some phone plans just didn't work well with doing the remote aspects of this. Uh, some people don't have the smartphone um, options. And so we just need to move those over to the more simple types of communication of uh, just telephone calls or text messages. Next slide. Also, privacy is always an issue. So um, we work uh, very closely with our HIPAA privacy office to make sure that what we're doing um, does follow their requirements for privacy, um, but also like the physical privacy of our clients. Oftentimes, uh, we find that clients will take these calls or try to do their video sessions in a home that they share with many other people. And so uh, making sure that they have privacy is important to us. We do an assessment at the beginning of the program to make sure that they have the ability to participate in these types of communications safely, um, whether that be because of um, a uh, romantic interest or a boyfriend, girlfriend, um, partner, family, uh, all these different things. We make sure that nobody will be put into any type of harm's way by communicating um, relatively frequently with health navigators. Next slide. So we did learn some lessons so far. We're still implementing, but let's see what those lessons are. Next slide. Um, they like what they know. And um, you, so you need to keep the tech native to their world. Don't make them download something completely new and learn a new platform. It just doesn't go well. Uh, once uh, familiarity was achieved, the tech was well embraced. So uh, people did enjoy um, having the ability to um, utilize the remote contact uh, once they got used to it. And COVID forced a lot of people to do this for the first time, and they kind of learned that they loved it and started implementing it in other aspects of their life. So we felt good that maybe we provided an avenue for communication for them. Video chat is important for those nonverbals, especially when checking in on mental health. So often you can just ask somebody how they're feeling, if they've done anything with mental health. Uh, you can, if you can see their nonverbals, if you can see them shift in their seat and feel uncomfortable, or see the giant smile on their face about their successes, you can pull a little bit more out of that. We've also learned that um, you see a lot about a client's life if when you can see the environment that they're living in. So um, you can kind of see their chaos or lack of chaos. Um, we had one person person walk us through his entire house and show him all of his uh, show us all of his baby pictures. Um, it's fun to be able to get to know kind of how people live and where they are uh, within their daily lives. Next slide. So if you are thinking about adopting this, here are some considerations. Next slide. Um, definitely find a platform that is adaptable to your needs. Uh, there's a lot of platforms out there. Some of them are very difficult to adapt and you have to take what they give you out of the box. Some you can definitely make some adaptations for us. We enjoyed having an, an end of session survey that we could 100% adapt for our needs. Um, I would suggest looking into the option of providing phone or phone coverage. One of the biggest challenges that we have is phones, um, phone services going out or people changing phones, um, people not having access to a reliable phone, and that makes it difficult to keep in touch with them, um, obviously. Always assess uh, and enforce privacy and safety. At every call, check to make sure that it's a safe space for them to be meeting, make sure they're not like on the bus next to somebody that can hear everything, remind them that some of the topics may be more private to them um, before they start. Usually people are already 10 steps ahead of us. And keep up to date of the ever adapting privacy standards for your institution. Uh, we saw our privacy standards um, change dramatically because of COVID. Even before that, there were situations that would change year to year. So always keeping up and, and having an open communication line with your privacy officers is incredibly important and knowing where, what you can and cannot do uh, to stay within compliance. Next slide. So this is the our, or these are the references that um, I mentioned for the model of care and then also for um, the peers for progress that I mentioned previously. Next slide. And this is our team. 
You can always follow up with an email. I'm the third name down. Please feel free if you have questions or um, comments about this, I'm happy to take them. Uh, and I look forward to having a question and answer session during the live uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to pass it off to Sarah Legrand from Duke. All right, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, all right, so uh, I am Sarah Legrand and I am at Duke University and I'm just trying to get my screens right here. Um, and I'm an assistant uh, research professor there uh, specifically within the Center for Health Policy and Inequalities Research um, that's within the, the Duke Global Health Institute. Um, and I'm here to talk about Style 2.0. So next slide, please. So uh, Style 2.0, or Strength Through Youth Living Empower Empowered, um, was an adaptation from the style, we didn't call it 1.0, but style, um, uh, intervention that Dr. Lisa Hyde Weidman at the University of, Chapel, or University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill developed um, that had, you know, was evidence informed, um, was conducted in the same area in which we're now delivering this intervention, and um, and Lisa's actually a, a part of our, our uh, program team. So um, it just felt like a really nice fit. And it also gave us an opportunity to really merge some of the things that were really successful with style with some of the other work that we've been doing in kind of the technology space. Um, so it's a really exciting opportunity for us to, to put this together. Um, so uh, just a few things about our, our target population. I won't go into you know, every bit of this, but um, of course, we are aimed to recruit, recruit 150 individuals who are HIV positive on the younger side, 18 to 35, um, who are black uh, men who have sex with men and are cisgender men. Um, we do expect them to be receiving their, their care in, um, in the Triangle region of North Carolina, which is Orange, German, Wake counties. And then I've listed here just the different criteria. Um, a person has to meet one of these criteria to, to be eligible for participation along with, uh, with the other criteria I mentioned. Um, all right, next slide, please. So, um, so the original style intervention um, was um, largely, um, well, entirely kind of an in-person type intervention. And there was a heavy amount of social marketing, which was very successful. Um, I, but it also included many of the um, features that we've retained in Style 2.0. Um, so we were able to really just kind of build on what was already existing by adding these, these virtual components. Um, so the virtual component, components include an app called Health Empowerment, which was developed for another study that, um, in which we found, um, and it, it was efficacious in uh, reducing condomless anal sex um, among HIV positive and HIV negative uh, black men who have sex with men. Um, we also saw some really um, positive outcomes in terms of uh, the continuum of care uh, uh, among that, with, with that um, sample as well. So what Health Empowerment does is a really comprehensive app um, that provides information and resources. A big part of it is that it fosters social support. And so the, the real, a real strength of, of Health Empowerment is uh, this effort to build community. Um, because, you know, as some of, some of you have, have mentioned uh, uh, before, um, there's so many layers of stigma and discrimination and structural barriers and um, that that can make, um, you know, keeping up with HIV care very, very difficult um, and very stressful and, you know, create mental health issues or substance use issues. And so having a, a community of people who, who are like you uh, can be really powerful. And um, so health empowerment also includes game-based motivational elements. I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, so it also, with health empowerment, um, it basically serves as a platform for the delivery of most of our virtual intervention components. So 
but within the app itself, we have a forum that I'll, I'll talk about more uh, later, provider messaging with the Healthcare Navigator, um, online support, video conferencing for our um, substance use and mental health intervention, um, a user profile and a, a knowledge center. And so those are kind of our main virtual components. Um, so we, we have also two healthcare navigators that, that have really quite giant tasks. Um, and uh, until recently, most of these were done in person. And so, um, you know, just, just to say that, that our healthcare navigators facilitate linkages for identified clients it really underestimates what they do. Um, so they're responsible, you know, kind of at the intake visit for um, really understanding uh, what their needs are, doing a really comprehensive uh, needs assessment or, and acuity index, um, looking at not only things related to HIV, but housing, um, insurance, social support, um, and also doing a screener for, for mental health and substance use, um, problematic mental health and substance use issues. Um, they also um, work with, with clients um, to go through at least five, the five core modules of the CLEAR um, program, which is a, the CDC's evidence-based uh, program that's based on CBT principles um, and is designed to promote behavior change. And then there are all many supplementary uh, modules that, that individuals can choose to participate in uh, if they so desire, if they have a particular interest. Um, our healthcare navigators also you know, will attend an appointment, the first appointment if a person's re-engaging in care, they haven't ever been to care, they'll go to the appointment with a person. Um, you know, in some cases we've um, even offered transportation uh, in a pinch. So they really do everything that they can to help facilitate um, re-engagement, engagement, engagement um, uh, or just keeping them in care. Um, so, uh, big, big, tall task for Brian and Taj, and uh, they, they do great work. Um, the other things, and, and these, these lower things were all part of the original style intervention. So really creating this medical social support network, um, having ancillary support services. So, you know, after Brian and, and Taj do a, um, this kind of comprehensive needs assessment, then we really want to try to uh, they really want to try to link to other services so that they can get those needs met, needs, needs met because we know that, you know, if they aren't met, it's going to be very hard to focus on HIV, mental health, substance use. Um, we, again, we do have a, a mental health substance use intervention. And this is a, essentially a, it's a four session motivational interviewing um, intervention. And, and it's actually done virtually. Um, and um, the goal of, of, um, of the MI sessions is to um, kind of build motivation for um, improving their, their behaviors related to their HIV treatment, uh, while also perhaps recognizing how uh, mental health and substance use may be affecting their poorer outcomes. Um, so it's a, you know, um, very much, you know, meeting them where they are and, and, and um, trying to build their self, self-efficacy to, um, to, to make changes, but also, um, you know, to, to become retained in, uh, in HIV care, but also if, they feel like they need additional support. They've recognized that maybe substance use or mental health problems are affecting their HIV care. Then our next step is to make sure that they get referred to longer term counseling um, that may go well beyond just motivational interviewing. And then we also have um, support groups. And uh, next slide, please. So, um, so, through, uh, through our app, um, we do have virtual visits uh, for both the healthcare navigator and the behavioral health provider. Um, 
the virtual the virtual visits for the healthcare navigator were not really the original plan. That has actually been since uh, since COVID nineteen. Um, so I, I think that you know some some young people would prefer to have an in person visit for sure. Um, you know, as Jeff said before, but um, but I think it also allows us to reach people um, that we may not be able to reach in person. Um, so um, that's worked really nicely. Um, another important thing that we do virtually is a warm handoff between one of the healthcare navigators and our behavioral health provider or our MI person counselor. And so they basically get, you know, on one of our, you know, approved platforms or even on the phone, you know, just to make that introduction, because I, I think there's often um, we, what we found is there's a lot of reluctance to kind of seek this kind of counseling. And so um, if it's not warm, it just gets dropped. <laughs> um, so that, that warm handoff is really important um, in, in uh, having a person go on and, and complete those MI sessions. Um, we do have virtual support groups um, using our, our, our video co conferencing platforms. And then uh, again, the app. Um, health empowerment app, which we are calling style 2.0 app for this particular uh, program. And again, it just uh, kind of indicates all of the things that I described before. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the app because it is a, a really important adjunct um, to um, the work that the, the healthcare navigators are doing. Um, that you know the providers that we're working with are doing um, with the work that our behavioral health counselor is doing. So anyway, just to describe a few of these features. So um, the forum is is really this is really the space where we're trying to build community, right? Um, so it's, it's really like a discussion board. Um, people can uh, post comments in a particular category category or they can uncategorize it. It doesn't have to fit into one of say eight different categories, um, but they can uh, make a post. It can be text, it can be audio, it can be uh, a picture, it can be a, or an image, uh, or it can be video. Um, and then it, you, know, you kind of get into your typical social media type interaction. Then people can comment, like, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Um, in the trial of health empowerment, uh, the original trial with uh, 474 young black men who have sex with men, uh, this was by far the most uh, frequently used intervention component. And um, just leading up to, to that time, we had really clearly recognized the importance of this community and social piece. Next slide. So you can see here, uh, starting on the left side, um, is it, uh, the, at, at the top of that screenshot, uh, people's opinions about gay black. And then a, a, a participant has written um, some information there and you can see their avatar there. Um, if you skip over one screenshot to the next, uh, one that says post at the top, you can kind of see comments. You can see where there's some likes. Um, so if a person clicks a star, then they favored it. Um, that particular, um, post. Uh, and so this really just, um, from our experience historically, um, really, some really profound conversations happen. Um, and in addition, a lot of support is offered for people who are, who are having a hard time. Um, it, it was really just like, gave me chills and, you know, could, could bring tears when, when you, we read some of the, the transcripts from all of the, um, the forum posts and the last study. It's really powerful. Uh, and it, it also just shows how much of a need uh, for this type of space there is. Um, and then, and the second screenshot, so um, second from, or yeah, from the left, um, is, is how a person would post a new post. So they would enter the title, the body text, they could choose an image, video, uh, or also they can link it to something um, uh, outside of the app uh, and then post it. And on the, on the far right, um, 
we have another type of um, approach that we can use in the forum, which is polling. And so we can post these, so having, having admin, staff admin or study admin post these polls um, that are then, you know, uh, in real time kind of, you know, calculated. So these can be really great uh, conversation starters. So if things are a little slow on the forum and people aren't posting regularly, then, then these can be conversation starters. All right, next slide. So provider messaging. Um, so another thing we've learned over time is that um, young black men who have sex with men um, with HIV really wanted the opportunity to have a direct line of communication with their medical providers, uh, as well as support staff. And so in our app, we do have a, a messaging system that allows us, users to message our healthcare navigators who can then reach out to their provider and kind of be a liaison. Um, and also they can reach out directly to the behavioral health counselor. And uh, we're really committed to responding to them quickly with, with the uh, questions that they have. So within 48 to 72 hours. Next slide. So this is an um, example of the provider messaging. Um, so in the middle, the middle screenshot is where a person would ask their question um, and send it to the expert, which is our healthcare navigators. And on the left, what you see um, is um, the, the questions that they ask are, um, only included in the, the, the text is only included in the app if it can be fully anonymized. Um, so there's no way that that person could be, could be identified. So, uh, but sometimes there are questions that may come up more than once or um, a question that, you know, by answering it, we feel like, you know, we could, would pro be providing a very, um, powerful or important message for other participants in the app. So say we take great caution in, in how we do that, if, if we do that and how we do it, if we do. Um, but it does kind of create a little Q and A uh, and real questions from people you know, who are actively using the app, um, but also being very mindful and careful not to, to um, attribute it to anyone um, in the app. And so on the right screenshot, um, you see that uh, the person who has posted has earned the student badge um, because they've asked the expert one question. So that's one of the badges that they can earn um, over the uh, one of many badges that they can earn by uh, regularly engaging with with style 2.0. Next slide. All right. And so um, in terms of uh, online support, uh, the, we do have online support groups uh, hosted either by WebEx or Zoom. Um, and also the uh, either WebEx or Zoom are being used by the behavioral health counselor um, or uh, the healthcare navigator. Next slide. And we have a user profile that shows uh, the user's name, uh, their avatar, um, their favorites, which I'll talk about, their badge prog progress. Um, and the idea with the, you know, this is kind of the hub of the, the gamification piece of this, that personalization and gamification will incentivize them to continue to use the app. Next slide. So on the left side, you see uh, the profile page. And um, Brian, of course, is one of our, our health, healthcare navigators. In, in the real world, we would not let somebody use their real name. Um, but rather just a pseudonym. Um, but if Brian were to click in the circle where uh, the little person icon is, then um, he would be able to select an av avatar from the next screen, as well as the background co color. Um, that can be changed and updated as, as much as, as uh, users want. So a little bit of customization there. And then um, on down where well, they can see how many posts they've made, how many comments, how many questions they've asked, um, so if they can also follow people in the forum. So if there's a person who is writing interesting things or um, they feel like, you know, their situation really resonates with theirs, they can um, follow them. So it, it's easier for them to see their posts when they, um, uh, it basically collates their posts for them. 
Um, so the stars are for save content. So if you click on something, you save it maybe to read it later. Um, and we have a community guidelines, care locator, uh, and also a little bit farther down, which just wasn't enough room, is um, the place for the badges. And so you see the third screen um, shows how many out of the uh, 65 badges this person has earned. Um, and, and again, on the right, it's just another example of a person earn, earning the badge for logging into the app three times. Next slide. And the resources uh, section is primarily brief articles um, uh, on health and wellness for this particular population. Um, some of it is on HIV, some of it is on mental health and substance use, but some of it is on, you know, just general well-being, uh, nutrition, self-care. Um, we certainly don't want to just focus on, um, on HIV, right? I mean, we really want to be holistic and um, um, in, in our, our health promotion. All right, next slide. Okay, so this is uh, actually a combination of our app resources and app activities. Uh, so the two slides on the left are um, the resources functionality. So in the resources section, uh, there are a variety of different um, articles that uh, are assigned to, we have several different topics. Uh, you can see on the top there, creating change, life skills, greater sex, safer sex. And um, but they can just scroll through them or they can actually um, kind of filter them based on particular topics that they're interested in. Uh, and they're just really nicely designed articles, that, you know, that include imagery, they, they try to keep them short, make so they're engaging. Um, and so you can see an example of an article on the right, uh, just to the right of, of that. And we also at the bottom, you know, are ask, ask them, asking them if it's, if it's uh, helpful for them. Uh, so we can get feedback on what articles are or are not helpful and adapt as we move forward. Um, and then the, on the far right is, a, um, is the activity screen. And so in this component of the app, um, we include things like uh, quizzes and assessments. Um, an assessment, for example, uh, might be the drug, drug abuse screening test, the DAS-10 that you can see there. Um, and um, a, a goal setting option. Um, so, and then people can track, you know, how they're doing, how many goals have they set, how many quizzes have they completed. Um, and with the quizzes, we want them to be informational, but also some fun ones as well. Okay, next slide. All right, so also for us, you know, um, COVID-19 COVID uh, didn't have um, as dramatic, uh, the, the ramifications were not as great as they were for some, right? Um, just because we were so leaning digitally, digitally anyway. Um, so, you know, we, we did have to, kind of stop everything for a bit, you know, till we figured things out, how we're going to do this. Now, since we had some gaps for sure, but um, it, it wasn't very hard for us to, um, to kind of uh, just move the remaining pieces that, that were in person online. So we're doing all of our healthcare navigation through virtual visits. Um, we've even had, you know, a healthcare navigator go uh, with, a with a client to a, a, an appointment and just was on the phone. So, um, so there are definitely solutions, um, even when it can't be in person. And, and I think that it was actually something that was, the, the per person was very, very appreciative of having, having him on the phone. Um, support groups are continuing and they are also uh, virtual. And um, behavioral health is the same. So, um, that didn't really have to change. We did, I think, have to kind of pivot quickly when we realized that how, how important that warm handoff was um, and making sure that that was still, we were still able to do that um, virtually as well. Next slide. So um, early implementation. So, um, one of the really fantastic things that uh, has really helped us in the 
design adaptation of our study is a really solid youth advisory board. Um, and they represent members of the young black men who have sex with men community in our area. Um, all have tremendous skills, tremendous insights. Um, and they're, they're been very excited about the te technological aspects of this, this project for our program for some time. Um, and they've reviewed content that we've created. Um, they've reviewed protocols for us and they've offered some really um, great feedback that have resulted in substantial improvements in, in our program. So they have been uh, an exceptional um, uh, addition to our team. So some of the challenges, um, the app development timeline has been an incredible challenge. Um, one that is um, uh, a great source of frustration on all of our parts, but, um, but it's, it's, there's simply nothing we can do about it. It is, is truthfully out of our hands, you know? Um, so some other issues, um, you know, we, we, we can run into connectivity issues for some people living in rural areas. Um, and we have also found that, that some people are reluctant to enroll now um, during, you know, the COVID-19 era without having some sort of in-person connection first. So that's been a little bit of a struggle for us to, to, um, to surmount. But um, we're making progress. Next slide. The end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Armstrong Tingwani. Um, I'm a senior managing director for prevention services at GMAC, but I also serve as the PI for, for Project Vogue, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. Next slide, please. So just a little overview about Project Vogue. Um, like the other initiatives, it's for BMSM, and uh, we actually work with 18 to 45 year olds. Um, you might wonder, it's called Project Vogue. Um, initially, the design was to work with House and Ball community members, but we have since um, expanded um, uh, members of priority population to also include people who are non-ballroom. And um, like Priscilla mentioned earlier on, this was adopted from Project Silk out of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And uh, we really um, uh, focus on four service areas uh, with this project that is providing a safe space for artistic expression because Project Silk is, is recreation-based, uh, it's a recreation-based model of care. Uh, for this specific population will also support clients uh, by giving them very tailored individualized HIV navigation services um, and support you know them in, in pursuit of their authentic selves and obviously we link them to HIV treatment and behavioral health care services as well as leverage um, um, on the, 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 the amount of services that the agency offers across the agency um, our mental health services are located within GMAC. Our substance use services are located within GMAC. So it's based on these four service elements. Next slide, please. So speaking of the mobile app, which is gonna be the focus of the presentation, um, this is a partnership between um, ourselves, GMAC, and New York, um, Department, New York State Department of Health AIDS Institute. So um, it's an expansion of the Why Get It uh, project, uh, which was um, um, the actual app that we're talking about today was, um, was one of the products from the Why Get It project. It was another SPINS initiative um, that was meant to develop a social media intervention or social media interventions to engage HIV positive youth, youths and young adults um, in the HIV care continent. So this, app called GET consists of a HIPAA compliant application and um, they did it in partnership with Mount Sinai primarily to help in engaging, linking and retaining young people into HIV healthcare services. So a lot of this, uh, the Why Get It project's uh, uh, characteristics and the aims and the features are in alignment with, um, with 
Project Vogue, with those of Project Vogue. Uh, that is why we chose to move ahead and integrate this into, into, into our project. Next slide, please. So the innovation is really um, integrating the mobile app, like I said, into our model, care, model of care to support HIV navigation services. And possibly in the future, because the Get It app is just part of a whole package of, 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 of services within the Why Get It uh, project, possibly we might adopt one of the um, educational and empowerment graphical, graphic ser serials called Tested. Um, it's, a, it's a series of comic uh, messages um, and sketches um, that are shared predominantly on social media via Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. But our focus is gonna be on the actual app uh, for now. Next slide, please. So this is, the, the, this, our, this is our model of care. It's a 12 months intervention. Our goal is to use this app for the full 12 months uh, from enrollment. The clients are gonna be asked to to, at the time of enrollment, after the needs assessment, are, uh, the needs assessment is completed, they're gonna be asked to, to download the app together with the peer navigation ambassador, um, go through customizing it, uh, similar to what style 2.0 does, and then um, the peer navigation ambassador will work with the client uh, to utilize some of the features I'll talk about throughout the, 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 the implementation of that continuous um, uh, that, that, that individualized action plan, as well as some of the other non co uh, services that we offer through this project. So it's gonna be part of the 12 months um, intervention. Next slide, please. So these are some of the key functions we're excited about with this app, with the Get It app. Uh, the first thing, um, and with this, we anticipate that um, we might actually utilize this app for the life of the project because of the social distancing measures that have been put in place. Uh, we don't think that things are gonna change anytime soon, get back to normal. So we're really gonna capitalize on these features as much as we can. Um, um, so the first function is really the, the, the staff to client or client to client engagement, uh, whether it's through individual support or group chat functions. Um, uh, the peer navigators are gonna work with the clients to implement those individualized action plans. Um, we're gonna have uh, mutual support group sessions um, uh, take place through this app. Um, originally we had planned that they were gonna be in person in the drop-in space, but this is one feature that we want to capitalize on. And then we're gonna use this as well for, for, for our consumer advisory activities which is mostly gonna be uh, consumer advisory meetings. Uh, we are not gonna have a, no, a, a traditional uh, cab. Uh, so it's gonna be virtual, it's gonna be open, it's gonna be on a rolling basis. And then another key function about this app, it will allow for tracking of medications and labs. Actually, the client can populate the app uh, with contact details of their care team, whether it's their provider, their social worker, um, nurse case manager, pharmacist, any member of their care group, they can enter the details in here. And um, the care provider can also enter viral load and CD4 count data into the app as well. And um, we'll also track any key milestones and appointment, appointment reminders um, for, for any medical and behavioral health services. And the other component about this app that's not on this slide is that it's, uh, it has an educational and information module um, that will be able to share content related to HIV, sexual health, wellness, mental health, and it can either be articles or infographics or videos that are um, linked to our YouTube account. Next slide. Please. So <laughs> compared to our two partner initiatives, we are still in the early stages. Uh, we actually just started uh, the integration process in June uh, of this year. So a lot of, we're having weekly meetings with our ACE Institute partners. And a lot of what we've been doing was developing content, which is we're actually working on right now. 
um, and the possible blueprint of the rollout plan. So we are in the process of getting there. Next slide. And then after we develop the content, we're done with that. We're just going to do uh, training for JMC staff on how this app is utilized. That's going to be provided by ACE Institute, of course. And then we're going to test it out with a few clients and members of our consumer advisory board uh, to just see, you know, the user experience, how acceptable each of these functions are, and just overall usability. And based on that feedback, we're going to adjust um, some of the features, the functionality, as much as we can. And then we will do a full launch rollout, possibly by end of October 2020. Next slide, please. So potential benefits. Actually, we're going to be talking about potential benefits here. And the next slide will be about challenges. I just wanted to, um, to share that these are based on experiences and expectations as we roll the app out. Um, but I think they could be applicable to any of you, any of your agencies, if you have plans um, of considering integration of a mobile app like this. Um, uh, so, so I think they could be applicable. So some of the potential benefits, um, we think they'll be enhanced client retention because of how seamless this virtual, virtual engagement is between our clients and the peer navigation ambassadors. And um, the, 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 the linkages and the navigation support through that individualized um, action plan is really personalized. Um, um, it's tailor-made for each, each client. We usually tell people um, our support, uh, our philosophy is to be as non-traditional as we could possibly be um, in, in supporting our, our, our clients. So this will allow it to be, uh, to, to, to be that personal. And then I think Jeff mentioned it, uh, minimizing possible travel barriers in a big city as, as this one, you know, transport, access to transportation, just having that Metro card is still an issue for a lot of our clients. So that could be a potential benefit. And then it's got the potential to also increase peer effectiveness um, in terms of how and where they can use the app in engaging with our clients rather than being confined to certain spaces or certain, yeah, especially in the office um, or computer. So the other benefit is that the app um, can be expanded to other programs within the agency beyond Project Vogue. That's actually something we are thinking of doing. Once we really figured out through Project Vogue, we think it can benefit many other, many other um, clients within GMAC, especially around um, ran wide um, services. Next slide, please. Potential challenges. Um, this can be an expensive endeavor. Uh, the cost can be prohibitive especially for initial acquisition of the app. Um, and as you think of acquiring such an application, also think about sustainability, those um, annual maintenance costs, or whether you want to add in a new feature, that might cost you money. Um, so so cost, cost is important. And then consumer acceptance on the benefits and use of this app can go either way. We haven't rolled it out, we haven't tested it, um, but they, might either they might accept it they might not so um it's something we are we are equally prepared for and to work around it to see how we can we can enhance that user experience and then there's a ton of um chat platforms online so there's that competition um to some extent we've been having conversations with our clients using this private messaging either through facebook or Instagram and all that. So trying to introduce another platform um, uh, uh, might create potential challenge in how they, the uptake and how they, they, they accept uh, me using it as another, as another tool on top of everything else that they're using on their phones. And then it's a benefit, but it also, can also be a burden, a challenge, at separating work time and personal time by project staff. Um, because our peer navigation ambassadors are also from the community. 
Um, so sometimes there's that thin line between being a staff member, um, supporting a client and being a community member. So by having the app in your phone, they might even uh, sometimes feel compelled to respond to a client at any time of the day, 11 o'clock at night, four o'clock in the morning, because, you know, as a community member, my community member asking something from me, um, I don't have to look at what time it is and um, I just jump in and assist them. So we're just going to work around that to really try and balance that with our project staff. So it, it doesn't look like they, they work 24 hours by having access to this app. And then you might also want to consider confidentiality. Uh, any platform, as it's been mentioned by the previous speakers, it's important that uh, because we're dealing with medical data, we're dealing with um, uh, um, confidential stuff, uh, um, we want to ensure that um, that application is HIPAA compliant. And most of the times we know that um, the more compliance, it is, the more compliant it is, the more money uh, that comes with, 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 with the app. Um, actually, with the Get It app, we've just realized that um, it doesn't have a video function and um, just having initial conversations about maybe adding it into the app. Um, issues of HIPAA compliance came in and uh, potential increases in costs were also uh, something that was mentioned. So we don't have a video function, but we do have a voice, voice function. So HIPAA compliance is key to any online engagement platform. I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much.